Hello, I am Jay Prakash Narayan, interacting with you in Ask JP. In Ask JP today, we'll take the question from Sai Sushant. Sai Sushant is an electronics engineer from Bangalore. Sai Sushant, the floor is yours. Namaste, JP, sir. Namaste. This is Sushant from Bangalore. I have seen you many times stressing on the importance of restructuring the local governance systems in India. Before I ask questions on this aspect, I am showing some captures from a street having top MNC companies with around 15,000 employees working there. Now my question sir, why should I pay 25-30% to 30 of my salary as tax to central government if my daily life is majorly impacted by the efficiency of local government? Why is this inefficient chain of central government collecting the funds and then transferring some part of it to the states and in turn the states transferring some part of that to the local governments? Our current local governance is such that we don't know whom to complain, where to complain. If my street is not properly cleaned, roads are in bad condition, minutes of street dogs, etc. So for every minor issue in my street, why should I go to a distant municipal office? Why can't we have a decentralized local government? I can myself find some flaws in our current local governance system with just one example. Can we get an elaborated video on your vision for an ideal local governance system? What exactly needs to be done by central and state governments? And what role does citizens play in achieving this? Eagerly waiting to see your response sir and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Sai, for that very insightful question about local governments and the picture that Sai showed about uh, the locality of an MNC in Bangalore is pretty much symptomatic of the rest of India. Almost every city, including Delhi, where you have mounds and mounds and all, story upon story of garbage piled up in some pocket or every other city, the garbage on the streets, the pollution, the water bodies being adversely affected, poisoned, and a whole lot of things. We all live with it. And of course, the bad traffic management, and the bad roads and drains overflowing, water, water being pumped at enormous cost but not reaching homes and streets being flooded. These are all endemic in large parts of the country, sadly. I think it's a great question. The first part of the question is, well, Sai obviously agrees with me. I don't know if all the viewers would agree with me, but I would like to make a plea. I genuinely and passionately advocate strong local governments because that's the only way things will actually work. The more centralized the government is, the more remote the government is, the more disconnected it is from the people's day-to-day -day needs. And the more difficult for us as citizens and voters to understand the link between what they are doing and what happens to our lives. Grand policies, they may be very worthy. But it's really incomprehensible to us. And the more distant the government is, the more difficult for us to see where our tax money is going, how it is spent, in what way are we and our families benefiting from that. And the more remote the government is, for these reasons, the more difficult for us to really make an assessment of who performed how and then vote sensibly. It is not an accident that in this very highly centralized system where there is no link between the vote and consequences, between the taxes and the services are received, many people, they are expecting payment for a vote. Let's be truthful. In Karnataka, where Shai is now living, or in Telangana, where I live, or in Andhra Pradesh, or in Tamil Nadu, many states, it is a fact that people are expecting money during elections from every major candidate. It's also a fact that in many cases, they are refusing to go to the polling booth unless money is delivered. Let's not hoodwink ourselves. There is a deep problem in our democracy. The central reason, among other things, is the connect between taxes and services, between vote and consequences is broken in a centralized system. And therefore, in a country of mass poverty, illiteracy, lack of sense of citizenship, democracy is reduced to voting and shouting. And voting, in a large measure, is influenced by the money and inducements or the short-term individual temporary welfare measures. 
short term welfare measures, the cost of long term growth and collective services, or divisions in society, caste, region, religion, language, etc. These are not accidental, these are inevitable consequences of a certain design. I am fond of giving an example. You live in an apartment, you pay monthly maintenance, and you elect your peer group, some people whom you trust, who, have, who are willing to give their time liberally for the collective cost to maintain the common amenities. Suppose the lift does not function. Suppose the garbage in the campus is not cleaned up regularly. Supposing the drains overflow within the campus. Supposing water supply doesn't come to your apartment. Or supposing the watch and ward is not there and some rowdies and gondas come and bother you every day. Then you will holler. Because you know who is accountable. You know where your maintenance money is going. You know who is responsible. And you will force them to deliver. If they don't deliver, you will yourself take charge. That is democracy. Democracy is not voting and shouting. Democracy is not about grand issues, it's about simple issues. Let me give an illustration. In India, there's a great example. R.S. Bharati. I'm not his acquaint, I'm not even an acquaintance, I only spoke to him on telephone once. There's no relationship, there's no political connection. I'm just giving an example. So let me give this example of R.S. Bharati from Alandur. The outskirts of Chennai city, it was a municipality of 80,000 or so population some years ago. Now, R.S. Bharati has credibility as a local leader because earlier he served as a municipal chairperson and he ensured quality water supply to the, that small town. When another opportunity came to lead, he inspired the local people, the first small town in India to undertake a project of underground sewerage system a regular, proper underground sewerage system. In India, even today, even big cities don't have 30, more than 30-40% coverage. And small towns is unheard of. So he inspired them. And because of his leadership and credibility, the people came forward to pay for the future connection charges, sewerage connection charges. He raised some 7-8 crore rupees. Beginning the first mover, he got some loans at concessional rates from multilateral agencies and others. And he executed a first-rate drainage system for that small town at a cost of some 50-60 crores. Exact amounts I'm not familiar at this point of time. But see the consequences. Within two years, the property values went up about 10 times. Instead of the filth and the muck and the, and the stench of improper drainage system, of night soil contaminating everything that you see, becoming an eyesore, you now have a properly clean and hygienic and healthy sewerage system. And suddenly, the people understood the value of living in that locality. The property values went up. So the people see the link between the actions of a government and their own fortunes. Either services delivered immediately, improved quality of life, or improved assets. I was traveling one day in Northern California, from the east to the west on some road, I forget the name of it. To the north of that road is the city of Sunnyvale. As you know, in, in the United States, even at 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 population is called a city, unlike us, where we have a, a notion of a city being lakhs of people. To the south of it is Cupertino. My friends told me, do you know that the property values in Cupertino are about 50, 60% higher than in Sunnyvale? And I was surprised because when you see it, as you are traveling on the road, you don't see a difference in terms of physical infrastructure. Visually, there's no difference. They look in the same manner. So I asked my friends, no, I don't see any difference in terms of the infrastructure. They seem very similar. So is there any demographic difference? That means if there are some blacks and Latinos in some pockets because of the social prejudices, property values are down. And if they have the dominant groups, residing in another locality, property values may be high. I said, is there, is there uh, the issue? They said, no, demographically also they're similar. Then I ran out of ideas. I said, how come there is so much difference? Then they told me in Cupertino, the school district functions very well. There's a highly decentralized local management of the schools in the United States. And the school district Cupertino functions very well. And already you're paying taxes and therefore you're 
School fee is covered in the taxes. You don't have to pay any out-of-pocket fee to admit your kids to the school. Because the school is doing very well. People want to reside in that area to be eligible to send their children to the public school without any additional cost. And therefore, property values went up because there is greater demand than is the supply of houses. The link between what happens in terms of local government and your own life, in this case, property value is going up and children getting a better value, better education. That is true local government in various levels. Not only tiers in terms of sizes, it's also about stakeholders. For instance, the school district board in the U.S. is a stakeholder empowerment, not merely traditional local government based on geography alone. It's about stakeholders empowering a group of people or school boards or school education committees or whatever conceptually or water users committees or something else. So basically power should be as close to people as possible not as far away from the people as possible, so that accountability is there, people understand what is happening, you can hold them to account. This is called the principle of subsidiarity. The farther it is, the more unaccountable it is. Therefore, if you give power to a distant entity, the question should be, why have you given power to them? Ideally, power should be only the entity closest to the people. Because some services require economies of scale, some are very complex, some cannot be done locally, defense cannot be local, a national highway cannot be local alone. Currency printing or management of currency or banking regulation have to be, have to be national. So some because of the scale and the scope or the complexity or the nature of the task, they may require bigger entities handling it. But the question is, why is power being transferred to a bigger entity rather than a local entity? Not the other way around. Now to the questions that uh, Sai Sushant raised. One, is it right for the union government to collect a bulk of the revenues? Sai, so world over, there is greater efficiency of collection in a centralized manner than decentralized manner. As economies grow, as people's incomes and corporate incomes grow, the easiest way of collecting taxes is through income tax or corporate income tax. And they are necessarily world over federal taxations for a variety of reasons. Therefore, collection of taxes at the federal level is much more easy and convenient and efficient. Contrary to your point that it's inefficient, it's not true. And the issue is in that case, is there adequate transfer to the state and local governments? In India, we have actually a pretty good transfer system. Take this year, 2023-24, fiscal 24. I'm giving you the budget figures. Out of the 33 trillion rupees plus, 33 lakh something crores of the revenues that are anticipated by the government of India, according to the budget. You know, 18 trillion rupees, 18 lakh crores plus, 18 lakh crores plus is transferred to the states in a variety of ways a small part to the local governments, bulk of it to the states in a variety of ways, including the Finance Commission transfers constitutional devolution, certain grants in aid, so-called centrally sponsored schemes and other things. So nearly 55 to 60 percent of the total revenues of government of India are going to states. Therefore, that is not a problem. Who is collecting taxes is not a problem. Certainly, local governments also must collect taxes. There's no question. And there must be a link between taxes and services. There's no question. And therefore, property tax, that's the main tax in local governments, and there are a few other taxes included. That is, really, all over the world, that's the main tax. But there's a limitation. If you only go by property tax, you're not able to tax income, because not all income is reflected in property. And assets go except where the physical assets in the village or in a town where a house is there, there is no other tax available locally. Therefore, while property tax and other local taxes are vital, we must encourage them. That cannot be the sole source of revenue. So that part let us understand. But the second part is the sharing of revenues. While a significant part of the union revenues in India are going to states, very little is going to local governments. If you take the expenditure of the total government in India, union, state and local, 
the local governments in india spend only about 3% of the total money if 100 rupees is spent by the government roughly 3% if you take out cities like mumbai perhaps delhi then that money comes down drastically local government share of expenditure is incredibly small in india compare that with china an autocratic country but otherwise comparable to us in many respects do you know in china i have the numbers here in china the federal government spends only about 20.65 no 14.7 percent that means about under 15 percent of the total government expenditure under 15 percent of the total government expenditure by the federal government in beijing the states or the provinces and local governments together they spend about 85 percent in that 85 percent in that 85 percent Roughly 20% or so is by the state. 80% is at the local level, in various states, the county, the city, something else, etc. It varies from state to state, but this is a broad outline. In other words, China has the highest amount of devolution and expenditure at the local level. Out of the total expenditure of the government, the local governments in China they probably account for about 65 to 70 percent, the highest in the world. Take a country like the United States, a federal country. The federal government raises and spends 52 percent of the resources of the total government budget. The states are provinces, states, 50 states, 23 percent. Local governments, 25 percent, more than the states. Take a country like Canada, another federal country. 32.3% federal, 42.8% provincial, 21% local. Take Spain, 55% national, 32% state, about 12% local. Take almost any country, Germany, 60% federal, 22% state, 17.5% local. So local is bigger than or equal to the state, and China is biggest, biggest of all. World over, because of increasing propensity for centralization, because many welfare programs, healthcare in particular, they are all federal expenditure in many countries, unlike in India. And therefore, the federal expenditure and federal taxation are much higher. That's the reason why they are exceeding 50% in many of the federal countries, modern countries. But suffice it to say that India has the lowest share of local government expenditure in the world for a federal country. India also has the lowest degree of empowerment of local governments in the world. Even China, autocratic China has strong and empowered local governments. United States, Germany, um, almost any country you name it, including Latin American countries like Brazil, Mexico, etc. Local governments are very powerful. Australia, India is an ex even Britain, even Britain, a unitary Britain, while they don't call them state governments, the, the governments in uh, regional parliaments, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, they all have a lot of powers delegated and the local governments in turn have immense powers and they spend a lot of money. So the issue is the distribution of both functions and powers. As I keep repeating ad nauseum, we created a large provision in the constitution, a vast constitutional body, 7,700 words and 73rd and 74th amendments for local governments, larger than the American constitution. The whole American constitution as it exists today with all amendments, larger than that. But we created overstructured, underpowered, notional local governments which are inconsequential on the most part. Whether it's Bengaluru or Hyderabad or Chennai or, or um, any other city, local governments have simply no role, have simply no power. They are weaker than during British time. Mumbai city or Kolkata or Madras, the British government were more powerful. Subhash Chandra Bose became the chief executive of Mumbai, of Kolkata city, at the behest of Chitranjan Das, without being a member of the bureaucracy. The local council, the municipal council, was given the authority to appoint its own chief executive. 
And Subhash Bose, while he was chief executive of that municipality, was jailed for his participation in freedom struggle. But Chitrajindas forced the government to allow Subhash Bose to function as chief executive while in jail. As long as he was in Calcutta jail, Alipur jail in Calcutta, that practice continued. Imagine the autonomy of local governments, the respect accorded to them during British time. In the so-called independent India, we centralize power so much that local governments in the most part are irrelevant, inconsequential. There are a lot of reasons for that and there are a lot of structural anomalies. This is not the time to go into great detail, but that needs to be addressed. And the other point he made, it doesn't mean that local government will automatically function better, particularly in a climate where governments in general are autocratic, unaccountable, generally corrupt, unresponsive. And vote buying and expenditure in elections, they have become endemic in assembly and Lok Sabha. Therefore, the same practices will also be borrowed at the local level. I have no illusions. So, we have to have very strong systems of accountability and transparency locally including citizens charters and a whole lot of things so that people can hold the local government to account. Mere empowerment in a romantic way will not help. Finally, a very good point that um, Sai Shushant raised. Our cities are very big. Just because we call it a local government, it doesn't mean that it's really big, it's really small. They're very big and unwieldy. Let's take big cities of India. Each has a crore of population, some, some of them have two crores, two and a half crores population. You know there are 144 countries in the world, 144 countries in the world with a population less than one crore or 10 million. So just because you call it local in Mumbai or Bangalore or Hyderabad or Chennai or Delhi, there's no point saying they're local, therefore power is devolved. No. The point Sairaj is very important. Unless there's further sub-devolution to smaller local entities for things that can be managed locally. Local government is meaningless. Take London City. London City has 32 boroughs. Real governance of London City, the municipal functions are all in those boroughs, 32 boroughs. There were local traffic, local roads, local water supply, local garbage, parks, schools, everything. All are maintained locally. In the 32 boroughs, the borough council has all the powers. The London mayor, directly elected, primarily takes care of the transport system, including the metro and the bus system and so on and so forth. Takes care of the police and crime, fire services and a few specific areas of larger development. But the most municipal functions are at the borough level, 32 boroughs in London city. Our constitution created in Article 243 is some kind of devolution within the city. The constitution says if a city size is 3 lakh or more, the population is 3 lakhs or more, there shall be many ward committees comprising of one or more wards. What is the idea? That a city is converted into smaller municipalities for de facto administration. That is the idea of the constitution. In reality, in many cities, the ward committee size is bigger than 3 lakh population. Take Mumbai city. Because they had what are called wards, they use using the word ward, sometimes 15 lakh population. They created a ward committee for each old ward, which is 10-15 lakh population. The constitution is violated in letter and spirit. Not only the issue of size, it's also the issue of function. If the functions are not locally handled, you take garbage management. If most of the garbage is not handled locally, if you make it into a big centralized problem and dump it all to hurt some pocket, like in Hyderabad city, we have Jawahar Nagar, where lakhs of people cannot even live because the stench emanating from the garbage. There must be decentralized management. If the local road, local school, local park, local traffic, local water distribution system, they are not managed locally. For a city to manage, Cities which are bigger than 144 countries, in a country where the bureaucracy is generally unaccountable and unresponsive. It's absurd. It's not local any longer. It's only no local notional. It must be as local as possible. Therefore, the sub-city government, when the city exceeds 3 lakhs or 4 lakhs or 5 lakhs population, 
with significant municipal functions devolved with democratic participation and management and people's participation directly wherever feasible is very critical. We, of course, in India don't want it. We don't want to empower the local governments. Even where the constitution explicitly stated there should be ward committees, we don't, we violate that in letter and spirit. Even when they are created, they are meaningless. We need to change all this. So, local governments are critical. And without genuine local empowerment, neither will the quality of life improve, nor will we as citizens have actually a meaningful role in shaping what is happening. We only have a role in voting and then protesting and complaining later on, nothing else. And we will never understand the value of the vote. Therefore, our democracy continues to be derailed. While elections are held, nobody is pointing a gun to people to vote or not to vote X for X or Y or Z. Election votes are counted honestly. And the person who is elected is actually forming the government, as long as they command the majority in the legislature. To the extent our democracy is operating. But in real detail, it's operation success and patient debt. Local governments are what make democracy really work. They are schools for democracy. And we failed in institutionalizing them. And the result is, despite all the tall talk in the country, our civic life, our day-to-day -day life, our garbage management, our local schools, local health care, our water supply, sewerage, if it rains a little bit, there's no storm water drainage. It floods almost every city in the country. And sewers overflow everywhere. Traffic is chaotic. Pockmarked roads. Manhole covers not properly managed. Now we see the problems. Of it. Our parks have become heavens for criminals in many cases. So there is enormous need and scope for improvement in local governments. And unfortunately, there is no consensus among the elites in government or outside. The politician, the bureaucrat, the middle classes, the media generally are very resistant to local governments, at least the urban population, which sees the benefits of good local government functioning and which understands the pain of bad local government functioning. And the urban people increasingly are paying taxes, property taxes, they are aware that they are paying taxes. And they are unhappy that the services are not commensurate with the taxes paid. So unless the pressure comes at least in urban areas from the thinking and taxpaying class, I don't see why the political parties and governments will be inclined to transfer powers to local governments. So let us raise our voice in each city for genuine empowerment with accountability. Empowerment with accountability and people's participation. And we already are late. We are 75 years too late. At least now if we begin, A, it will improve the quality of life and B, over time that will improve the quality of democracy itself. It will not happen overnight. But people will slowly discover what is actual self-governance, what is the purpose of the vote, and where do taxes go, and we will mature as voters instead of this vote buying, short-term individual welfare measures at the cost of the long-term good of society and division of society and caste, region, religion, language. Not a well-functioning democracy. This is a dysfunctional democracy. We have to set it right. And effective and empowered and accountable local governments are at the heart of their setting right.